All right, man. April 2023 Blu-rays. Let's go right into it, man, because we got a lot of great titles this month. So starting over in the UK, coming to 4K is uh, from 1995, The City of Lost Children. Uh, this was a film that I started watching many years ago and for whatever reason never ended up finishing. Um, this was one that I, uh, who is that, Ron Perlman's in this? Yeah, that's right, Ron Perlman's in this, uh, directed by uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Junet. That name sounds so familiar. Oh, I think he directed Amelie, actually. Uh, yeah, no, I've not seen this one, but this is one I've always heard good things about. Um, also on this day, coming from uh, a label that I've talked about recently, Second Run, is a film I'm not familiar with, Lauren, from 1989, directed by uh, Robert uh, Seigel. Or Siegel. Um, I talked about previously on one of my episodes when I was discussing Coach to Vienna, how much I've been, in, uh, how much I've uh, been looking forward to a lot of their releases, and uh, this, and um, I think Twilight has already come out, or is coming out, Twilight from 1990, uh, which I haven't seen either, but uh, anytime they're putting out a title, I engage with my interest a bit more. Uh, from the BFIs, a film I've talked about uh, a couple of times in the show already, which is Drew Skalimowski's recent film, EO, uh, inspired by uh, Ahazar Balthazar by Robert Brisson. And I've already talked about this a couple times, but I love this film. Um, I think this is just a a very beautiful meditative film, uh, light on dialogue, just these great long sequences following this donkey through the countryside of, um, I don't know exactly, I don't remember where it takes place. Uh, very different in a lot of ways from Alizar Balthazar, but uh, it's, when I, I mean, it's, it's a riff on that film, or it's his take on that film, not remake, more so than just the fact that you're following this donkey as, uh, as the main character in this. But um, I imagine this is probably going to get a criterion at some point in the States, uh, Yanis Films distributed this in the U.S., and, um, well, at the time of recording this, this doesn't have a Blu-ray. Um, this uh, is available to watch on the Criterion channel, so, so I would imagine this is probably going to come sometime this year. So uh, I might hold off on this release and just to compare the features and compare which one will be the better release, but either way, this is available... <laughs> Uh, and this is interesting. I don't know uh, who is distributing this one, but this is the Bob Cluck Horror Collection from 1972 to 1974. Oh, God! Oh. He's home. Andy! I didn't know Andy was home. Is that Andy? Joanne doesn't even know he's home yet. She'll be so surprised. But Andy wouldn't kill anybody? This includes three of his films, uh, Black Christmas, Death Dream, and Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things. Uh, Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things, I believe, I want to say that was his first film, but I think something may have come before it, so I'm not entirely sure about that. But Death Dream, I think, uh, is probably my favorite Bob Clark film, except this has a Blu-ray in the U.S. from uh, Blue Underground. This is a great uh, coming home from Vietnam kind of film, and there's something off about this guy. Uh, that's just a, um, one of the best films from that era that I, I think that even with that Blu-ray from uh, Blue Underground uh, doesn't still quite have the talk. I mean, I, I mean, horror fans know about it, but in terms of the general consensus, like Black Christmas, it's uh, still not quite there. Um, but Black Christmas as well, I've talked about previously on the show when this got a recent um, 4K from Scream Factory. Uh, also, I should say that, yeah, Children's Triple Death Things was not his feature film. It was actually She-Man, a story of fixation, which I have seen, and that's why I was doubtful. I was like, I was like, man, I'm pretty sure I watched that, and that, that was his first. And uh, that's a, I think that was the film. I'm trying to remember, it was the guy. It was the girl who was blackmailing the guy into to acting like a girl or dressing like a girl. I don't remember, man. That's a, that was a something weird title. I had seen a, a couple months ago, actually, I believe. Uh, but yeah, so that's there. I mean, all three of these um, children's trip their death things also has a 4K in the states from VS VCI, but also regular Blu-ray as well. Uh, children's trip their death things I've talked about a little bit. <laughs> It's an interesting film. I, I've only ever seen it once, so it didn't leave much of an impact, more so than just in the re in the uh, context of the rest of Bob Clark's work. Um, but I don't know if this is just the same disc as, as the, uh, or the same features, I should say, as the U.S. Um, uh, release. This is coming from Black Label uh, 029, which I am not familiar with. Um, so if you already have those releases, uh, then I guess it'd, be, I guess it'd be good to uh, compare to see which ones, whether it was better off to buy this or to buy the other titles. The other blues, I should say. Sorry. A uh, this is interesting here. The Pete Walker Heritage Collection. Now, uh, Pete, Wa Pete Walker has had a handful of his titles released in the states um, by Redemption, I believe. Uh, I am trying to remember which ones of his I've actually seen. I don't. Man, I couldn't turn off the top of my head. But this has uh, for men only: School for Sex, The Big Switch, Man of Violence, Cool It Carol, and Home Before Midnight. Uh, all of which I have not seen, but. 
Uh, Pete Walker's name I've, I've come across a lot, but I don't think I've seen enough of his work. I, I can't really, I don't really know how to gauge a lot of it, but uh, it's there coming from, who's putting this one out? Uh, from 88 Films. All right, man. Very cool. So jumping over into the U.S., some of these 4Ks were also coming to the U.K., but I figured I'd talk about them all here at once. From 1941, uh, well, we have a couple more of the uh, Warner Brothers uh, 100 Years um, 4K titles coming. I recently just picked up that Training Day 4K, and I haven't uh, looked at the um, transfer on it yet. Because I actually just rewatched tra- rewatched Training Day not that long ago, so I'm not in a rush to rewatch it again. Um, but I, I'm not crazy about the big kind of banners they have at the top of the the 100 years. But what I really do like a lot that they've been doing is that each of the new releases has had, has had new cover art uh, that's not previous posters. Like I, I have the uh, first couple titles here that I really like both these covers, and I like what they did for the um, the Training Day 4K as well. Uh, but anyways, from 1941, directed by the great John Huston, uh, the Maltese Falcon. What have you ever given me beside money? Have you ever given me any of your confidence, any of the truth? Haven't you tried to buy my loyalty with money and nothing else? What else is there I can buy you with? Starring Humphrey Bogart and uh, Peter Moore in a small role, who's great in the film. And what's interesting about this is that I think this was one of the first uh, film noirs that I saw. And it's different than a lot of film noirs because this is very dialogue heavy. There's not a lot. I mean, at the beginning, you get uh, uh, you get all your action out of the way. You get right into the conflict. And the rest of the film is a great kind of mystery about this. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? About this kind of elusive uh, uh, falcon that these characters are looking for. And Humphrey Bogart, who plays the detective, gets, kinda, uh, gets mixed into the situation with a woman involved, uh, played by... Um, Oh, gosh, man, what the hell is her name, you know? I believe it was Mary Astor. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's interesting that if if somebody was trying to get into film noir, this was, this is an essential film, but I don't know if this would be the first film I would jump to because I've seen this film three times now, and the first time I saw it, I remember not responding to it in the way that I thought I would. You know, you watch a film that's considered a classic of its, of its type, and um, there is that uh, pressure against it. You know, unbeknownst to you, you may think that you're going to be blind, but honestly, if I tell you that this is, con- you know, this is... With anything, man, it's like even now with like Rotten Tomatoes and stuff. It's like, oh, this film has a perfect, you know, Rotten Tomatoes score. It's like, oh, the pressure's on. You try not to be biased. You know, so the first time I saw it, I liked it, but I didn't quite connect with it. And then each subsequent time I've seen it, I connect with it more and more. You know, because uh, I think the first time I kind of, I got I got a little lost in the story in terms of uh, specific plot elements, uh, in terms of specific character relations, how they got to certain points in the film. Um, but now I'm able to appreciate the strong dialogue, the strong acting, the hints of comedy that are there throughout uh, Bogart's charisma that comes through. It's one of the best of its type, um, and I think I already have the regular Blu-ray of this, but I'm going to compare the features on it because I might be upgrading this. Um, another one, another is considered a classic from 1967, a film that I hadn't seen until fairly recently, is actually um, Cool Hand Luke with Paul Newman. And uh, this is one of these films that I, I, you know, it took me a little while to see it. I, I was never avoiding it, but when I finally saw it, I was uh, just surprised. I would shouldn't say surprised as a negative thing, but in terms of watching it, and watching it um, in a contemporary state of mind, how uh, how little has changed, man. This film flows. It's like it's like bread on butter, man. It just flies by. the The pacing in it is fantastic. It's directed by um, uh, Stuart Rosenberg. Uh, you got Paul Newman in the film, of course. Uh, George Kennedy, Strother Martin, J.D. Cannon. It's a great cast, man. Uh, this is one of the best films of its type, and and um, I love prison films. I love. Well, for the most for the most part, really, this is a different type of prison film. But it's uh, uh, you have this character in this film. You have Paul Newman, who um, who is working uh, in this uh, southern prison, and the problem that he's trying, to, the problem that he goes through, he's uh, you know, there's hard asses there. He's trying to escape. Uh, the third act of this film, I think, is some of the strongest man in, in all of the film because I don't want to get into spoilers or anything like that. But I think that's where the tension really rises, and the ending of this film is unforgettable. Uh, if you're like me and you just ha- and you hadn't seen this film previously, or uh, you haven't seen this film yet. I think this is the perfect time to check it out because, uh, yeah, I'm, I really can't underestimate me. And this is, honestly, man, you know, people talk about, oh, who's uh, who's better, you know, Redford or Newman? And I think Redford's great in his own roles, and I think Newman's great in his roles. You know, I can't, it's like, I'm not going to choose one or the other because they're both great at what they do. But this film really kind of shows much in the same way that a film like, um, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 I, I, I don't want to say... Uh, Books Cassidy or The Sting, because, you know, I'm trying to find a, uh, a Robert, a Redford, Redford film on his own, but something like, uh, uh, like, sort of like The Candidate, I guess, would, would be a good choice to see, like, wow, this, this is really a truly, truly one of the great charismatic leading actors, man. It's just phenomenal, the film. Um, as well, on this day, coming from Shelf Select, a 4K of Midnight Run with Robert De Niro and Charles Grodin. I've seen this film once, and I think this is a lot of fun, man. This is a, this is a, uh, one of my favorite kinds of films. It's a road trip film. It's, you know, uh, Robert De Niro is, uh, 
I can't remember if he was a detective or he was a cop. Either way, he's got to transport Charles Grodin across somewhere, man. I apologize. It's been a little while since I've seen this film, so I'm not going to act like I remember the de details specifically. But this is, a, you know, De Niro from this era, I think, is really great. This because is when getting a little bit more of the lighter uh, uh, De Niro films like this, where he's still playing the straight man, but uh, it's still a very funny film. It's a film that's constantly entertaining. It's not constantly laugh out loud funny, but but really one of my favorite films from the late 80s, man. This is such a fun film, uh, and I... If when I when this is on sale, I'll definitely be grabbing this man. Um, also on this day, previously a couple months ago, we had the Star Trek the original series um, coming to 4K, and now we have the next generation films. We have uh, Generations, First Contact, Insurrection, and Nemesis. And uh, you know, when I was younger, probably like when I was in high school, there's about three or four years, man. I was, I was maybe more than that. I was real hardcore Trekkie, man. So I, you know, it's it's interesting to watch these films now and with the original series films because one, you got to watch them. You get well when you watch them. You gotta you can watch them two ways. One in the context of the show that is coming from. In this case, next next generation, of course. Um, and two, how do they hold up as films? And I think that's the difference between the original series films and the next generation films. And I'm not gonna go on a whole tire or anything like this. But when it comes to original series films, you don't have to be a fan of the series itself to be a fan of the films. And what I mean what I mean by that is you don't have to watch the show. You know, I think Star Trek Two is one of the great science fiction films of the 20th century. Um, it's a great. Ta it, it's like a, almost almost like Shakespearean tale. You have a, you have a character in this film who has to go through, uh, uh, who has to really kind of come to terms with one his place not only in his and not only in his own life but in the world and two having to accept a loss he'd never accepted before. And I think that's one of the main things that subsequent Star Trek films have tried to emulate, but have uh, really kind of missed the point. And when I say subsequent films, I specifically mean Star Trek Nemesis and Star Trek Into Darkness, the J.J. Abrams one from... Uh, was it 2013 or 14? I don't remember. But both those films, I, they they try to get the same idea, but really kind of miss the entire point of it. Is that just because you have a character has to make this kind of sacrifice in the context of the film, it doesn't exactly make sense. And I think that's when it comes to these the next generation films. I don't think they work. Well, they definitely don't work as Star Trek films at all. I mean, they're it's completely nonsensical, man. And they don't. I don't think any of them really work as films in and of itself for, for different reasons. I'm not going to sit here and just slam against the films, but when it comes to generations feels like very, it feels very half-assed. You have some of the original cast in there, but not only a couple. You have what you have, uh, Kirk, Chekhov, uh, Scotty. I think that might be it. It's a very uh, clumsy passing of the torch. There's a part in the film you have a character who uh, has the ability to kind of uh, uh, undo the events of the entire film and basically stop the whole conflict. But instead, the character decides to go into the middle of the conflict, and you're and you're just wondering like, what are you, what are you doing, man? This is nonsense writing. Uh, and you have first contact, which of the four I think is the most probably liked. But even still, this is the one where it's it's almost as egregious. I mean, almost as egregious as Generations. You have Picard in this film, who's always been this sort of. Um, you know, very quiet mannered kind of, uh, you know, I mean, these characters really, you know, he's like an army general in a way, you know, leading this, leading this fleet. He likes Shakespeare. He likes reading. And this film, they try to mold him into this, some sort of action star that doesn't work at all, man. Now in this film, I do like, you know, they talk about going back to, you know, first contact day when I think it was the humans first met with the Vulcans. And that stuff, I think is the strongest film. I actually would really just like the film of that, but having the Borg in this film, man, it's just ridiculous. It's like after Picard went through all this, they try to make it, fe they try to make it seem like he's finally had enough but I don't buy it for a second, man. I just don't buy this character would do this. And as a film on its own, it's very clumsy. I don't think Patrick Stewart's, uh, at least with this type of script, is a very good action lead. Um, the, the set pieces are very clumsy. You have the first oh, you have the first sequence in the film right off the bat talking about there's no one else nearby. It's only the Enterprise. I'm like, what the hell? They're near Earth. What the hell are they talking about? There'd be a million ships. That's where, you know, Starfleet is. What the hell are they talking about? Only the Enterprise. It's ridiculous, man. Insurrection is, uh, um, I mean... I would say, I don't, maybe it's actually not even the weakest. I mean, it's, I don't, it's hard to kind of quantify which would be weaker. They're, they're, they're all poor in their own right, but this one is is totally just, the prime directive is out the window. They're trying to save these people on this planet when they've specifically encountered in the past, oftentimes, you like, you know, if, if, if something's going to happen to these people on the planet, it's not, you know, Picard has repeatedly said it is not his way, it's not the way of this other third party to interfere. What's going to happen is going to happen. There was an episode where, uh, where Wesley Crusher was trying to save these people who was, they was telling him, like, his plan is going to die. I got to get out of here. And Picard's like, you can't do that, man. Whatever's going to happen to these people, it's not our right to to suddenly gain this new sense of morality, man, that you can just decide when it's, when it's right to save people or when it's right, you know, when it's, I'm sorry, not even to save people, when it's right to interfere with this ecosystem, with these people. It's going to happen. It's going to happen, man. Um, 
And then Nemesis, which is just completely ridiculous. They have, uh, it's, it's absolutely silly. This is what I was saying before. They try to do Wrath of Khan again, but it doesn't work at all. It's, it's just, it's very clumsy. Uh, 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 earlier role for Tom Hardy has nothing to do in the film, man. He's just, he's, he's plays his character Shinzen. And uh, it's just not a good film, man. It, they, all, all four of these are just real stinkers. And, uh, you know, I don't want, I don't like railing against films, man. I really hate doing that. But I felt like for these films, because I, I want to direct more attention to, if you haven't seen any of these, to just go watch the first six films. Now, I know that not all, you know, People can like rag on, you know, uh, you know, five and the motion picture. And motion picture, I think, is, is great. I still think it, as, as if you watch as a science fiction film from that era in terms of in vain with films like 2001 or like the Andromeda strain or films like that, you have a really interesting psychedelic film. And even though Star Trek five isn't the script is pretty weak. Uh, there is, there's moments in there I think are really fantastic. I really love that stuff early on when they're just hanging around and camping. And I love the idea. I think it's a really cool idea. Kind of this, um, you know, in a show of, of, these purely scientific uh, conclusions, this almost kind of quasi-religious, well, not even really quasi, it's almost full-on religious kind of um, uh, uh, third act. And I think they're really cool, man. These films, I, I mean, unless you're a hardcore Star Trek fan, yeah, I mean, if you're already, if you're a hardcore Star Trek fan, you've already seen them, but I would say just don't don't even bother with these, man. These are just junk. Um, as well in this day, Confess Flex, which I'm surprised is actually getting a Blu-ray at all, man, because I this... Uh, got a pretty pretty quick theatrical release. This was out of theaters fairly quickly. I think this went straight to Paramount Plus after that. But uh, Brian Sauer was seeing some good things in this film, man. And I haven't seen the previous Flex films with um, Chevy Chase. I think this is kind of its own thing. To my knowledge, I think John Hamm kind of produced this film. Or this was just something that he was passionate about. But uh, I, I was curious about this one, man. Um, so I'm, I'm going to keep an eye out on this one. I'm glad to at least get in the Blu-ray. As well in this day from Severn Films, uh, I've already seen people, uh, an acquaintance of mine has his copy, but this is Wings of Disaster, the Birdemic trilogy. Um, I've only ever seen the first Birdemic, and, you know, you talk about, you know, so bad it's good to this and that. I mean, it's, it's, I mean the first Birdemic, man, it, it's complete nonsense. You should watch it. The acting's so stiff, man, you could nail, uh, you know, you could put a nail into it, man. It's, it's, it's insanity, but it's fun. It's a ridiculous kind of uh, a quasi-environmental um, uh, caution tale. These people are, uh, uh, I mean, inspired by the birds, and, uh, you know, the people, these cast characters, they get caught in a situation where there's these killer birds, well, I think the killer birds, I mean, the special effects in this film are, the birds really don't move a whole lot. They're very, uh, they're locked to the camera, so when the camera moves, the bird moves. It's ridiculous, but it's fun. I've seen it a couple of times, man, and it's just, uh, it's a good time. As for two and three, I I'm not really interested in those, because from what I've heard, they're a little bit more self-aware, though, like, you know, you have the director, James, uh, I don't know what his last name is, James Nugent, or something, and I don't know, um, when these films get a little more self-aware, that's when they start, stop being interesting. I, I find more, um, sincerity and I find more entertainment in a film that tried to do one thing but ultimately didn't successfully work out and um, what I say is that if you make a film you know if you're like Birdemic or The Room or one of these kinds of films you're trying to make a serious film and it ends up uh, being you know kind of a farce kind of something silly but people are still entertained by it um, while you may have not um achieved your goal i think you have achieved a different goal uh completely differently but completely successfully that i find just as i can be you know i find you have unlocked a a something something special in cinema man that unites people that uh i find really endearing and i don't when people say like oh so bad it's good this movie's, this movie's terrible this movie's horrible it's like yeah man but if you're watching it you know you're enjoying you're enjoying your time here I'll take a movie that didn't successfully uh, uh, do what it wanted to do but it's still entertaining that a film that did exactly what it wanted to do and is it's boring you to tears man so uh, these films I mean the first one's ridiculous I, I don't have any interest in two or three but that is coming to Blu-ray all three of them I should say because the first one already had a, one of Severin's uh, first Blu-rays I think one of the oldest ones so I don't know I think this is just Three, but I think it's just I don't I don't know if they did any new features of this or not, but I but I would imagine that I think this is just a three physical Blu-rays in this one. Uh, let's see here. Envy coming to Blu-ray from I think Shout Select or not Shout Select from Shout Factory. Ben Stiller and Jack Black. This is I remember seeing this poster a lot back in the day going to the cinema. This is what 2003, 2004. Yeah, I mean I remember going to the cinema and seeing that poster of the stack of money on this guy. I've always heard this is a terrible film, but uh, I'm not gonna. Lie. I'm kind of curious about it, man. I kind of have a soft spot for those early 2000s comedies that you know many people probably don't like, but humor is so subjective, man, that I can't even try to possibly uh, uh, relate, you know, any sort of uh, recommended quality or not. Um, let's see here. On April 7th, now this is kind of, I got really mixed feelings about this, man. So I talked about previously that After Sun, one of my favorite films of 2022, is getting, it was getting its Blu-ray from Mubi in the UK. And A24 have announced their own um, ex website exclusive. 
And I'm really not, well, number one, I'm really getting tired of these website exclusives, man. I don't know why they're doing it, man. It's nonsense. Just, I don't, I don't give a damn about the packaging, man. Because that's what they're doing, man. It's the packaging. And this, they really, this is really kind of a, uh, not a great release, what it looks like. I mean, there's barely any features, man. There's a commentary by the director, uh, Charlotte, whose name I am blanking on. I apologize. But, and then on the inside... I think it might be an interview or something, and then on the inside is like postcards and stuff. And whenever there's stuff like that, man, you look at those things once, you go, wow, these look cool, and then you never look at them again, man. And I'm like, get rid of that nonsense, man. Give me some good features. Um, yeah, I, I haven't looked at what the features are on the, on the Mubi UK release, but you're going to want to keep that in mind if you're planning on getting one of these these two releases. I mean, it's great that it's getting a physical release anyways. After Sun is a beautiful film I've talked about it before. Um, incredible performances. Uh, just a very emotional film that uh, I just have been thinking about since I've seen it. But I'm also, this cover art, man, I don't know what the hell they're doing, man. I get what they're going for, like a Polaroid, but it just does not work, man. I'm really not crazy about this release. You know, they did it recently with the Lighthouse in 4K and the Green Knight in 4K, and you go buy them on Diabolic, they're like 50 bucks each. I'm like, get the hell out of here, man. This is nonsense. Um, especially since that one, the Green Knight has already has a, a standard 4K, and two, uh, today, uh, they've released this, the, uh, the the packaging and the specs and all that for, well, I don't know about the specs, they've released packaging and all that for Aero UK's uh, 4K of the Lighthouse, so if you really want it, man, you, I don't know what the hell they're doing, man. They have titles like Lamb and Marcel the Shell that are still website exclusives, and I think Lamb has a 4 not a 4K, Lamb has a Blu-ray overseas, I don't know if Marcel does, but I'm like, guys, what the hell are you doing, man? This is just this is just ridiculous, man. Stop with this nonsense. But anyways, moving on from there, back over to the UK, we have on April 10th, the second site, 4K of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, which already had a 4K here, or, or I think they got announced around the same time, but it has the 4K here. This is getting the uh, big, uh, kind of massive uh, 4K set, the standard 4K, and then the Blu-ray. Uh, and whenever it comes to these kind of things, I always just get the regular standard uh, 4K. I don't need all this stuff in it. They have, like, like drive, um, giant box set, and all this stuff. I just give me the 4K. I'll be fine with that. Um, as well as Ark of the Sun God coming from 88 Films. I don't know what this is, man. This title sounds so familiar, but this is a 4K coming from uh, a no, no, it's coming from uh, geez, Louise, man, it's coming from 88 films, yeah. But uh, uh, you look at this cover, and whoever that artist is, man, he's it's, you look at him and I and the other work that he's done, and or and you know, it's just like, yeah, that's definitely his his artwork, man. So, uh, just wanted to mention that as well. Uh, that text Chase Massacre is coming on this day. Back in the U.S., continuing on with uh, the relationship between Terry Gilliam and Criterion, this is The Fisher King in 4K with, um, who is it, Robin Williams and Jeff Bridges, I believe. I've never seen this film, man. I actually didn't know this was a Terry Gilliam film until uh, somebody was talking about it recently. I don't remember, on some podcast, but I'm not familiar with this one at all, so I really can't say for sure, but um, I, still haven't, I still haven't grabbed that Baron Munchausen uh, 4K I think I'm probably going to get that during the sale uh, this July because I've said before, I think Terry Gilliam is, oh, you know who it was? It was Brian Sowers talking about the 12 Monkeys 4K that Arrow put out and he was mentioning uh, some films. That must have been an older episode because he was talking about how he hopes that the Fisher King gets uh, announced or something. Um, I said before, Terry Gilliam is really hit or miss for me, but when he hits, I think he makes really exceptional films. I really love films like 12 Monkeys, Time Bandits, uh, Brazil is great. Other films like uh, like Tideland is not really my kind of thing. Um but, but I'm very curious about this one. Uh, guess Gorgeous still ain't out, man. I don't know how many months have been talking about this title. Yeah, Gorgeous from 1999 with Jackie Chan still ain't out. Um, Infinity Pool is getting a Blu-ray. This is Brandon Cronenberg's recent film, and I believe this is going to be the R-rated cut uh, because this was edited for... The, the U.S., the actual cut, was a, was a briefly edited version. Uh, there were some shots, I believe, that were uh, too explicit, but I saw on Diabolic, I don't know who's putting it out, but I think it's uh, an overseas blue that's going to have the uncut version, so just keep that in mind uh, if you're going to be picking up this film. I, you know, it's one of these films, I kind of had the same reaction to this as I did with uh, his father's, uh, David's um, Crimes of the Future from... Uh, last year or two years ago, uh, is that, you know, there's a lot of ideas in it. I don't think they entirely come together. Um, I, with this film, I, uh, I, I'm kind of over the, the just crazy kind of like flashing imagery that's, 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 it just, it just came off as cliche, man. I, I, I think Alexander Skarsgård and Mia Goth are both very good in the film. Both those actors in the previous years have been really just kind of showing, really I'd say Mia Goth more, has been showing more uh, of how great of an actor she is, whereas Alexander Skarsgård, um, I, has, I think has always been a phenomenal actor, all the way from Zoolander, you know, to, to this. I think he's really great and has a lot more range than a lot of filmmakers gave him. You know, I remember when he was in that show, True Blood, and he was so stoic and serious, and then uh, seeing him in films like uh, War on Everyone, which I think is a really fun film. He's a very good actor, man. I, I He's one of my favorites working, and he's one of these guys where even if I'm not crazy about the film, 
I think he always does a good performance in this. And I'm not slamming him or anything like that. I think uh, when it comes to a film like this or Crimes of the Future, even though I'm not really a fan of either, uh, I would rather these filmmakers kind of take chances and take risks and do kind of weird things that, even if they don't totally work, are off the beaten path in different man. So, and, you know, some people do like this film, and that's cool, too. I'm, def- I'm definitely saying that if you're curious about it, definitely check it out. It just didn't work for me, but I'm very curious what he does next, man. I was a big fan of Possessor, um, and I still haven't seen Antiviral, but, uh, you know, good stuff. Uh, Hell's for Heroes is getting a Blu-ray from Kino. This was a, a Steve McQueen film. I've never seen this one, man. I've always wanted to. I think this is the one... Gosh, what the hell is the name of that film that has... Um, Oh my gosh, man, this is not my time. <laughs> you know, every time I record one of these, man, I'm, I blank on names, man. But it's, uh, uh, it's I'm, I'm, uh, gosh, I'm gonna have to pause this for a second because I don't, I don't want to get the name wrong. No, you know what? I looked up the film I was talking about. I was talking about a different film called The Sand Pebbles, also with McQueen from uh, 1966. I got these two mixed up. Yeah, I've never seen this one. Always wanted to. Uh, always been on my radar. We'll be grabbing this, undoubtedly. Uh, more Jackie Chan stuff coming from Arrow. We have Heart of, uh, Heart of Dragon with him and Sammo Hung. I think some of the strongest uh, Jackie Chan films I've seen are with Sammo Hung. I think Sammo Hung is a great kind of... I mean, I uh, I, I read Jackie Chan. One of his... Um, Autobiography. I know he's done a couple, um, but he, but in that he talks about his friendship with Samuel Hong. They went to school together, and I think they're they're great back and forth, man. They're they're so good with each other. Uh, but uh, you know, neither upstage is the other. Uh, they both have their great comedic moments, and um, just phenomenal stuff. Not seen this one, but this cover art's got me very interested. Um, Living with uh, Bill Nighy uh, remake of Akira Kurosawa's uh, Ikaru. Uh, this got nominated for best actor and stuff. I, I thought this was such a charming film. I think I talked about this briefly. Um, the other the other actor in the film, I don't know her name, but she's very good in the film. She does a great back and forth. And Bill Nye in this film is, uh, uh, and I haven't seen uh, Kurosawa's original, so I'm going to be basing, you know, this off of, uh, you know, the plot synopsis. And I painted off this film, of course. Bill Nye, he, he realized they don't have much time to live. He's been kind of uh, shut off from, uh, not not exactly shut off, but he's very, like, kind of keeps to himself, very quiet. And he's realizing that he wants to do something with, with the rest of his life while he still has it. So he kind of uh, is going around. It's just, it's just a great film, man. I, I think this was really one of the highlights of last year. And Bill Nye, he gave a really solid performance. This kind of came on the tail end of the year um, and kind of got swept under. And even though it was nominated for Best Actor, I haven't really heard a whole lot of talk about it. But um, this is, yeah, this and, and Inikaru, you know, I... Uh, are both well, I haven't seen Ikaru, but the, but this film in particular is is, uh, is really terrific, and I'm definitely curious about Ikaru as well. On this day, coming from Sony Pictures Classics, uh, one of the best films. I guess this is I don't know if this is considered 2022 or 23. If it was 22, it would, it would undoubtedly probably be in my top 10. I know it's a contradiction right there, undoubtedly probably, but it definitely one of the. It, this was one of the best films I'd seen. That I guess is 2022, if not 23. Uh, the new film by Mia Hansen Louvre, and this is uh, Leah Saido, uh, One Fine Morning. Dans ces carnets, j'ai retrouvé des notes avec un titre A Nine Named Shannon Morgan. Tu veux dire Un beau matin. I really love this film, man. This is Leah Sado in the past couple of years has really proven me one of, uh, has really just shown me one of my favorite actors working. I think she has much more range and variety than uh, a lot of filmmakers uh, uh, lend her, where she can, and when even the, even a film like France that I wasn't really a big fan of, uh, I think her performance in that and her performance in this are, are very different, and it should really show the range of her as a performer. Um, I really love this film, and this is Mia Hansen Loof, who's uh, she's a widow. Her father is, uh, his dementia is rapidly increasing, man. He, she, he can barely even open the door. She's dealing with that. And you have the other guy who comes into her life and, but who he's married and has a kid. So, and she has a kid as well. Um, and it's the back and forth of their relationship where at first, it, you know, it's they're they're kind of flirty. And for the at first little while, it's all great. You know, they're, they're you know, it's a, uh, it's a, a very uh, sexual relationship. They're getting physical with each other a lot. And there's a certain point uh, where I think it becomes really interesting where the characters kind of go like, OK, where do we, you know, where do we go from here, man? Like, you know, th- there's a great part where uh, uh, one of them talks about, like, you know, what do you want to do today? And the other kind of indicates let's just have sex. And I was like, well, let's actually do something. You know, I mean, it was, you know, it's great and all, but let's actually like do something, you know. And it's great, man. I really love the back and forth between these characters because the, you know, you, you feel most for Leah Sado, obviously, because she's the one who is, uh, you know, she tells them, you know, when, when things get complicated, like, hey, man, this isn't a fling for me, you know, I really care about you, and, you know, I really, this isn't just, like, some kind of passing thing for me, you know, she starts to get a friendship with the kid, uh, and, you know, their kids get along, and, and the husband still has these complicated issues with his wife, and, and she's like, hey, man, I'm not, I'm not, like, I'm not, like, your, your mistress, man, um, 
I thought that I, this is a film I've been thinking about a lot since I saw it. Uh, uh, I really love the relationship between Lena Seydoux and her father. Uh, man, I just this is such a such a uh, one of the best films of recent memory that I just have not heard anyone talk about. But I just wanted to highlight this. This is getting a Sony Pictures classic, um, Blue. I'll definitely be picking this up. But I'm sure this is probably gonna be showing up on like movie I would imagine or something like that. All right, back in the UK on April 17th, we have a 4K. Blu-ray coming from Arrow, David Cronenberg's Naked Lunch from 1991, adapted from the novel. Uh, I don't remember who it was written by, but I think of all of his films, man, this is the one that uh, is one of his most interesting and, and could be probably the hardest to engage. You know, I think this was around the time where he started doing, uh, uh, in, in, really in the 90s, started doing more, um, I don't even want to say experimental, because that's definitely not the right word, but he definitely, definitely started doing more transgressive work, films like this and Existence, uh, or Existence, I never know how to say it, and, and Crash. He's really a very different kind of, uh, I mean, if you want to call it not really horror but sort of like horror adjacent if you will but i find this to be such a fascinating film man i've only ever seen this once this is with um what the hell's his name uh uh Look it up here. Uh, this is with P- P- Peter Weller. I almost said Peter Boyle. Definitely not him. <laughs> Peter Boyle from 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 Joe, man. Uh, Peter Weller, who uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to try to describe the plot. Basically, gets himself in a situation where he uh, murders his wife and is on the run. But he also has to make these letters to these kind of uh, you know he's a, he's a he's a what are they like a, like a kind of like a bug killer. I don't know what the name, but it's, these giant bugs start talking to him. They need him to like write these letters and stuff. And it's a film that you know if you're if you're trying to get an ABC plot, it's not going to happen, man. It's it's very uh, hallucinating very strange. I think, uh, who the hell is also in this film, man? It's, um, Roy Scheider, I think, is a small role in this. Um, but this was, this is such a cool film, man, and I think that uh, of all of his films, this is one that will probably benefit the most on rewatches, more so that once you know what you're getting into, because the first time you, I watched this film, man, it took me about a quarter of the way through to be like, alright, man, stop trying to find a, a concrete narrative, just just sit for the ride, and, and it's really solid, man. Uh, you know, I was listening to, as well, speaking of Brian Sauer before, where he talked about getting the video drum 4K in the UK, and he said that that 4K was better than any of the previous releases uh, because apparently with that one that was a new uh, rest that was a new actual restoration from now don't quote me on this but I think it was from the negative um, whereas sometimes with Criterion and uh, Scream Factory that they're not doing I, I, I said before the version of Suicide the fact that was a Studio Canal um, transfer. Or Studio Canal is putting that out that you got to be you got to be careful about which uh, 4K upgrades are actually new masters or are just new restorations from the previous restoration. But definitely, definitely uh, going to be keeping an eye on this. I might uh, be importing this for sure. Uh, the Street Fighter trilogy is also coming. This has a uh, Blu-ray from uh, Shout Factory in the States. I've only ever seen the first Street Fighter. This is the film that. Um, uh, Christian Slater goes to see in True Romance. The first Street Fighter, I think, is a lot of fun. I, I'm, I'm not as familiar with a lot of Sonny Chiba's work. He's a name that has always popped up, but I have just not seen it. But I remember the first one being a really fun film, man. I'm very curious about those sequels as well. Uh, more titles coming from Radiance Films. We have The Man on the Roof and The Sunday Woman. I'm not familiar with either of these titles, man, but like I said before, some of their other releases, I just think they're so cool what they're doing. I've only picked up one of their releases, which is A Woman Kills, which I've just been hearing great things about. Um, and I've also seen that, you know, Welcome to Dollhouse is selling well, and Working Class goes to the Heaven just got a standard, and I just I love what they're doing, man. I really need to get out more of their releases. Them and a second run have been really hot on lately. So in the U.S. on April 18th, we have uh, uh, some more big 4K titles here. I'm not going to spend too long on a lot of these for the sake of time and for the sake as well that a lot of these have been talked about to death. So I don't really know what else I can really add. Um, but we have from 1957, uh, 12 Angry Men, directed by um, Sidney Lumet. I'm really this artwork got mixed feelings on. They really kind of make it seem like Harry Fonda is the center of this film, and while he is the closest to a primary character, this cast is so stacked as it is, man. I don't really think that you needed to just highlight simply him. Now, I don't know if this is an original poster or not, but, I mean, you have a cast like, yeah, Martin Balsam, Lee J. Cobb, uh, uh, E.G. Marshall. Uh, I mean, come on, man. It's, this is a great ensemble film. Uh, man, this is just a terrific film as well, man. This has a previous Blu-ray from uh, from Criterion. Again, gotta be careful making sure if you want to upgrade or not. Um, this is this was remade in the 80s with, I think that Robert Mitchum was in it or something like that. That's when he was doing a cool kind of, uh, these these cool kind of film uh, productions, man. He was doing uh, or films of, of uh, I think, stage productions. He did, like, you guys, you guys see the back championship season? Very cool stuff, but uh, great film. Serpico coming in 4K, uh, coming 4K as well. Also from Sydney, Sydney Lumet from 1973. Uh, now, I actually just watched this recently for the first time. This is, I'd never seen this. Uh, this came out in between The Godfather and The Godfather 2. And really interesting comedy film, man. I think what's really interesting about this film that I, I really took away from is the, the use of time in this. Because as you watch the film, you know, you see uh, B- uh, uh, Pacino and his beard getting kind of like bigger and bigger. And at first, when I was first watching it, man, it was... Um 
it took a little bit of time to adjust because there's a, there's a sequence early on where he meets this chick and then he's on a motorcycle. He's like, hey, man, let's go hang out. And the next scene, they're in a relationship. They're going to a ballet. And it's, uh, you know, at first I was like, what? Like, that seems like, you know, I watch some films where it's like, we need these characters to be in a relationship. So let's just go right into it, man. It's like, wait a minute. You got to slow your roll, man. You know, you want us to buy into the performances. You got to let us buy into the time, man. But it works in this film because it jumps a lot in time. We see kind of him uh, uh, starting out as a cop and seeing kind of the a lot of the corruption happening on the force. And, and people are saying, just, you know, just let it go. You know, we're all making money, it's all good in that, where, you know, they're treating some of the guys in the streets, I don't remember exactly where this took place, I, don't, I think it was Chicago, I don't know if it was Chicago or what, I don't remember, but uh, but he's like, nah, man, I'm not going to sit by and let this happen, and, and, you know, sometimes, like I said before, some films where the commentary on the film, the message of the film oftentimes can get in the way of the, of the story, you know, um, great film, uh, uh, not sure uh, what the features are on this release, uh, but we'll be keeping an eye on this, as well, coming from more from uh, Warner Brothers, in 4K on the 100 year release or the 100 years Warner Brothers is Rebel Without a Cause with James Dean man this is a, this is one of these films that has gotten so big more so than the film itself where I feel like this is a film that uh, people have seen the poster of they see the image of James Dean in his, red, in his red jacket but have not exactly seen the film and I think they really are missing out man because this is a really terrific film man you have James Dean in this film Natalie Wood uh, directed by Nicholas Ray uh, great this is a film where you have this character who uh, uh, and I love that title too Rebel Without a Cause is a character who's an outsider but almost like it's kind of forced to be because he has no one else he goes to school some trouble starts happening man i think this is a terrific film i, I think this is really solid stuff I, this has been released on blu-ray a couple previous times but um if I could find this man in, in store. I mean, the thing with the training day 4K is I only found that because I, was, I happened to be at Target at the time and they actually had that Blu-ray. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to be grabbing this for sure, man. Uh, but I think this is a terrific film. Uh, now, this was one that I think everybody kind of saw, or at least I would imagine most people probably saw coming because this already had a previous stand, uh, Studio Canal. Or no, maybe it was a Studio Canal. Maybe it was BFI. One of the two had a 4K of this a little while ago. And I think... I, even when I talked about it, I was like, this is probably going to come from, probably going to come to Criterion soon. Uh, Ingmar Bergman's seminal film, The Seventh Seal from 1957, Max von Sydow in the film, uh, the most famous of his work. Uh, and, and, you know, for good reason, man. This was the first um, uh, Bergman film that I saw. Also in this film, you have uh, uh, some of his regulars like B.B. Anderson and Gunnar Br uh, Bjornstrand. And the funny thing about this film, I, I think I may have told the story before, but I, I don't know. But either way, when I was young, very young, probably like elementary school, and I was trying to get serious about foreign films, I wanted to see Seven Samurai from Akira Kurosawa. And I went to the library, and I picked up The Seven Seal by accident. But I, and I knew it was like going to be a long film. I knew it was about three hours, but I was like, okay. I was home from school one day, and I'm like, I'm going to watch this film. And... Um, when it was over, I was like, oh, I was a lot shorter than I thought I was, and then I realized oh, I bought the wrong, you know, I'd buy it. I, I rented the wrong film. I mean, now it's obvious. Cause like, But I think more so, it wasn't that I was thinking of Seven Samurai. I think I just saw Seven, and I was just like, oh, okay, this must be what I'm associating with. Um, but this is a brilliant film. I think, I mean, one of uh, Bergman's strongest in his filmography, a beautiful kind of meditation on life and death. You have Max von Sydow. I was kind of wandering through the scenarios. And um, uh, it's a film that uh, I'm curious if they're going to do his other work in 4K, because I don't know what other films would have 4Ks. I think this might just be it. Um, whether or not this is... I, I would imagine this this is the Studio Canal with BFI transfer. I'm not exactly sure. I'm going to keep keeping an eye on this. Um, I mean, I think like, probably most people already got that broken box set, but so it's up to you whether or not you want to actually upgrade this or not. But this is one of his finest films and, and one of uh, uh, just the best kind of... Uh, really Swedish films ever, uh, honestly. And uh, one that I've not seen coming from Shout Factory uh, is The Haunting of Julia in 4K. Uh, this is one that I've heard a lot of people actually be really hyped on, people really talk about. I don't think this had a previous release or not, but this is one that every now and then when Shout Factory announced a title like this or Alligator or Alone in the Dark that are just these big films that people been, that cult fans have been waiting for. Um, those, those are the most exciting, man. And uh, no, I've not seen this one, but I'm going to be keeping an eye on this one. Uh, undoubtedly, you know, whether or not this, this goes on sale or not. Um, also, uh, uh, the radio film titles I talked about before for one of them, The Sunday Woman, is also coming to uh, the U.S. on this date as well. Wrapping it up in the U.K., uh, All Quiet on the Western Front is getting the 4K there as well, which is great. I've heard some mixed things on that transfer, man, on the 4K. Um, if I come across it, I'm going to grab it, but I've, I've, uh, at least getting physical, physical release. That's kind of what I'm more so than anything happy about. You know, if the 4K is not perfect, it's fine, but, uh, you know, I, I definitely do want to grab this in the U.S. right now. Uh, the Bullet Train, I think, got delayed. I'm pretty sure we talked about this previously. Uh, let's see. The Shiver of the Vampires in 4K and Two Orphan Vampires in 4K. I think this might be Indicator's first two 4Ks. I don't know either of these films, man. Two Orphan Vampires. Uh, is that a Jess Franco film? What the hell is this, man? That's uh, John, uh, John Rowan. Of course, two filmmakers I always get mixed up and make pretty two different two pretty different kinds of films, but those are coming as well. Uh, what I actually what I mentioned earlier, Twilight from 1990 is coming out on this day. I think this might have got delayed, actually. I'm not exactly sure. 
as well on this day, uh, from BFI, Hands Up, uh, and Identification Marks None, two films by Jerzy Skolomowski. Uh, these films, I think, were just on the Criterion channel because they were uh, hyping up the streaming uh, release of EO. Uh, I have not seen these films, I've, like I said before. I've only seen a couple of Jerzy Skolomowski's films. I've seen Deep End, The Shout, uh, now EO. And um, Identification Marks None is one I've, I've been hearing some really terrific things about. So whether or not I pick this up or, or not is going to be uh, time will tell. Some uh, indicator titles are getting standard releases. Absolution, uh, Birdie. Birdie, I think, is a phenomenal film. A very, uh, it's one of Cage's best performances in that film. Uh, the Missionary, Time Without Pity, and The Triple Echo. So keep an eye on those. Um, as well as uh, more from the Pete Walker Collection. Uh, for Men Only, Home Before Midnight, School for Sex, and Cool It Carol. Uh, I don't know, again, it, which of these films have U.S. releases or not. But um, if you're curious about those, look those up. On April 25th, back at the States, uh, Police Story 3, Super Cup. Uh, this is, I think, got delayed previously. This is Michelle Yeoh and Jackie Chan. I just watched Police Story 2, actually, funny enough, about in the last week, and I think Police Story 2 is phenomenal. I think both those films are just one of two of my favorite Chan films. The first one, I, I think, is brilliant. I think that has some of his best stunts he's ever done. Uh, I've not seen Police Story 3, but very curious about this, especially now with, you know, people are really hot on Michelle Yeoh again because of everything everywhere. That, and any, uh, if we can get more of her films out, that's going to be great. So here we have from Criterion in 4K, uh, Ruben Oslin's Triangle of Sadness. And it was, it was an interesting conversation I was overhearing people talking about, oh, the, the message in this film is very obvious. It's very, you know, the, the, it's a class system. You have the rich kind of on the higher part of the this, this ship, and you have the poor on the lower class. And then, and then there comes a certain point where the classes change. Yeah, the, the message is very obvious. But as long as you're enjoying the film, that's all that matters, man. Because there's another film that I saw previously. I, I don't... I, I, not even a film I dislike, but the film, uh, the uh, of the uh, the film, the menu, which to me the the message was very obvious, very uh, very uh, uh, very simple, man. But that's fine. But is the film good? And me, I wasn't really crazy for that film. I was like, eh, you know, the script's not really there for me. But people who have it's weird. I feel people who like that film and who didn't like Triangle of Sadness uh, lop criticisms towards that, which could very easily be uh, uh, criticized for that film. And it's like, man, as long as you like the film, who gives a damn about the message, man? You know, that's kind of where I'm coming from on that. And Triangle of Sadness, I think, is a very good film as well. I think it's a great film. Ruben Austin's a filmmaker who each of the films I've seen I've, I've gotten get better and better for me Force Majeure I like uh, I recently watched The Square I thought that was very good and Triangle of Sadness I think it's great I do think it is too long and I do think that I think the film would have been vastly improved by if it was just the first two parts of this it's some of the best I've seen this year I think part, the third part of this film uh, it, it goes on a little while for me but this is a really just a fun funny film uh, uh, just really great moments throughout Big fan of this film, and it's also a back-to-back Palm Door winner. This won the Palm Door, uh, nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars, and then the Square won the Palm Door. Uh, Action Mutante is getting a 4K. I think this has already had a Severin 4K. I think this might just be a standard release because I was actually talking to an acquaintance of mine recently who's really gotten into Alex Iglesias work, and I think he'd mentioned. I don't know if he mentioned that he was going to get this or he already had it. I have no idea. But I, I, Alex Iglesias is a filmmaker who is. They've put out some of his stuff recently, and I just have not seen like almost any of it, man. I think I've seen maybe one or two of his films, if that. But um, Curious about that. Uh, and this is cool, man. You have the Jackie Chan Collection uh, Volume 2 coming from Screen Factory, or Shell Factory. And I think there's some really impressive titles in this one, man. If the page is going to load, then I'm going to name off some of these. Because uh, Volume 1, I-, I wasn't really familiar with those. Um, but Volume 2, man, when they announced the lineup on this, I was like, all right, man, I'm on now, like, white on rice. Although, the- I think it is, like, 80 bucks. So I'm going to have to wait for a sale on this. But you have Winners and Sinners, Wheels on Meals, The Protector, Twinkle Twinkle Little Stars, or Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars, Armor of God, Armor of God 2, uh, Operation Condor, Crime Story, and City Hunter. I've seen Wheels on Meals. Uh, I, uh, I think I've seen Armor of God. I cannot remember for life. And City Hunter. And Armor of God and Armor of God 2 are two of his I think probably his most talked about films. They, the release history of those are very interesting. Some places got uh, Ar- Operation Condor 2, Armor of God, and some got, you know, this and that. But I think that um, this is one that, uh, more so than probably the first one, I think has some of his bigger titles. City Hunter as well, I think has Samuel Hung in that, but don't quote me on that. There was a point in time I was watching a lot of his films kind of back-to-back, so a lot of them uh, uh, blend together for me. So I need to watch these with kind of a fresh perspective. Um but uh, as well in the U.S. coming from Indicator as well as Shivers of the Vampires in 4K or Shiver of the Vampires uh, in 4K, uh, Suicide Club getting a Blu-ray from uh, somebody, the company whose name I'm blanking on right now. Uh, if Blu-ray site would cooperate for once in its miserable existence, man, that'd be fantastic because this website has been acted up me this entire time I'm recording it. But it's coming from uh, Discotech Media. I don't remember. Did they put out Pinocchio 964, which I actually did finally in the mail? Um, I don't know, but this is from uh, director um, uh, uh, Cian Sono. 
Uh, very big filmmaker, made a lot of stuff, Love Exposure, uh, you know, just uh, anti-porno. Recently he did Pr- uh, Prisoners of the Ghost Land. Um, I've never seen this one, but I remember back in the day, like 2005, 2006, people on YouTube would make these kind of gore compilations from movies and that scene on the train where they, it was always posted in these, man. I've not seen this one, but I've, but I've heard uh, mostly, I mean, I've heard that's kind of the main set piece, but uh, I've... I, I am very curious about this. Uh, Kid Galahad from 1962 is coming with Elvis Presley. I've been really curious about seeing more of Elvis's films, man. I, I recently just watched the, the his concert film, uh, uh, I'll t- uh, That's the Way It Is, which I thought was brilliant, man. I, I really love that concert. I'm a big Elvis fan. Uh, I've only seen Love Me Tender, and recently I watched Blue Hawaii. Blue Hawaii, I think, is really fun. That's one of his most, charis- that's one of his most charismatic performances, uh, but I am trying to see more of his work. I know towards the end is when he, uh, him, he got kind of forced into a lot of those, or it kind of got like this image of just like, uh, he, he wanted to do more serious work, but I forgot who was talking about it recently. Somebody did a good breakdown of some, some of his films, talking about how some of his films, he was uh, uh, really uh, uh, do, trying to do more dramatic work, and it just didn't come across, but Curious about this one. I don't know who's putting this one out. Um, and that might be it for the day. So, geez Louise, man. I've been talking to you off, man. If you're still listening at this point, God bless you, man. But all right, man. That's all I got. Thank you for listening.